So this will be the first in a series of lecture supplement videos where I attempt to diagram the key concepts of the German idealists. Now, diagramming philosophical concepts is an act of, um, that draws upon the power of imagination and uh, is a form of symbolic intuition. And so my hope is here that there will be more at the level of sort of symbolism in these diagrams than I can even rationally articulate. So there's a kind of symbolic depth to them uh, so that you might see more than I can even uh, explicitly articulate. On the other hand, there's always the risk of oversimplifying philosophical concepts by drawing pictures of them. So keep that all in mind. In this first video, I'm going to first set the stage talking about metaphysics prior to the Kantian uh, transcendental turn in philosophy, or what Kant called the Copernican revolution in philosophy. It's important to see how philosophy was done before Kant to understand why Kant's philosophy was so revolutionary. So let's start with uh, naive empiricism. For the empiricist like Locke or Hume, there's nothing in the mind that was not first in the senses. So we start with sensory objects out here in the world, and this will be the mind over here. And so for the empiricist, the idea is we have a sensory impression of the circle, and the idea in our mind of the circle is a kind of faded impression of the physical or sensory object out there. Now, the uh, pre-Kantian rationalists had a very different idea of ideas and how we come to have knowledge of objects in the world. They would say that, no, actually, these sensory objects that appear to be out there in the world are really uh, pale imitations of eternal forms that exist in some kind of platonic heaven. Uh, and so there's this numinous form up here, and the form of the sensory object gains its reality through participation in that form. And the human mind, through some sort of uh, theological um, predisposition, or in other words, God grants us uh, access to these ideas through a kind of, uh, through what Plato would call recollection or anamnesis, so that coming to have knowledge of a physical object in the world has more to do with remembering the transcendent form that corresponds to this object. So we, our souls, in other words, have all of the knowledge that they will ever have of the outside world uh, within themselves. And coming to learn more about the world is more about remembering what we have forgotten due to the trauma of birth, right? This is the Platonic picture and many of the pre-Kantian rationalists and idealists held to some version of this view. So, having laid out the state of things before Kant, I can now transition into Kant's view. Now, it's important to note here that um, the nature of space and time were, were not really considered in great depth um, before Kant, as far as they were relevant to knowledge or epistemology. They were considered just to be a sort of background container within which knowledge took place, but we'll see for Kant, space and time become very important. So we have the mind again, and we have objects in the world. Now, for pre-Kantian philosophers, the idea was that the subject comes to conform to the objects in the world in one way or another, whether through participation in a platonic idea uh, or through a sensory impression. The subject or the, or the mind conforms to the things or the objects. Kant reverses this whole picture and says that uh, the objects must conform to the structure or the organization of our mind. So for Kant, the mind comes sort of pre-installed with a set of categories for determining objects. And the logical relationships among these categories correspond to causal relationships among these objects in the world. And now, also for Kant, space and time are no, are no longer taken for granted. Space and time become forms of our intuition. In other words, they become uh, a result of the way that we are organized as knowing minds. So 
all of the objects that we experience in the phenomenal world, the world of our experience of appearances, takes place within space and time, which for Kant are provided by our own mode of cognition, right? So we come pre-installed with these categories and we come um, pre-installed with these forms of intuition of space or outerness and time, or uh, this inner sense of uh, succession of moments. Space has to do with the simultaneity of the existence of objects and time has to do with the succession of moments that we experience within our own stream of consciousness. So for Kant, space and time are merely phenomenal. Our knowledge of objects is merely phenomenal because beyond the spatio-temporal horizon of our capacity for intuition or, or sensory experience of the world is the realm of things in themselves or noumena, which Kant marks as a mere X, a sort of algebraic uh, variable, that all we can say about it is that it exists beyond our capacity to know anything about it, and yet uh, we know that the limit of our knowledge, due to the forms of space and time and the categories of our understanding, suggests that there is something beyond. But Kant says we can't know anything about it. Now, you might remember from the lecture for Module 1 that Kant was awoken from his dogmatic slumber after reading David Hume, specifically Hume's critique of causation or necessary connection. Hume said, as an empiricist, there's nothing in our experience of objects, even though there might be uh, um, patterns that we detect in the way that certain objects uh, correspond to you know, certain events transpiring, this billiard ball hits that billiard ball and the trajectory can maybe align with uh, certain differential equations or what have you, Hume says that there's no necessary connection. There's no experience in our senses of causation in the way that mechanistic science would require in order to ground the knowledge claims it makes about the world. So Kant realized this was a big problem for science and his solution, as I've already mentioned, uh, is to say that, well, actually, causality is a, a necessary way that our mind comes to cognize objects. And if objects in the world must conform to our capacity as subjects, then causation need be nothing more than a necessary law of our own understanding as it determines merely apparent objects uh, in the phenomenal world of space and time. Now, as we'll see in later modules, Kant sometimes contradicts himself by saying that this X is the cause, things in themselves are the cause of our sensory experience of apparent objects in space and time. Why is this a problem or a contradiction? Because Kant says the categories of our understanding, should, including causality, should only apply to the realm of phenomena within space and time as provided by the structure or organization of our mind. But now he's saying that something beyond the phenomenal realm acts as a cause. So he's applying a phenomenal category to, to the realm of noumena. And the post-Kantian idealists will point this out and use this contradiction as a kind of slingshot to power them uh, closer to a form of absolute idealism, uh, a form of idealism that Kant's transcendental idealism was meant uh, to avoid. Kant was worried that his form of transcendental or critical idealism would be equated with or identified with Bishop Berkeley's form of idealism, dogmatic idealism, Kant would say, where for Berkeley, there is no realm of things in themselves. To be is to be perceived, right? Kant didn't want that kind of idealism. He wanted there to be a real world out there, but he said it was beyond our reach. So this is the situation that we are left in after Kant's first critique. In the next uh, lecture video diagramming, uh, German idealism, I will move on to Kant's critique of uh, judgment and his critique of practical reason to see how his thought continues to develop in light of the critiques of his first critique.